Good morning, family of God. I am missing you once again. Yes, it's the second half of the year we've just stepped into and kind of going through withdrawals from not seeing you and, and uh, not being able to give you a hug. But anyway, I want you to know that you're in my heart, you're in my thoughts, and you're in my prayers. And I'm lifting each and every one of you up to the Lord for His grace over your life, for your health, your protection, your provision, your healing for those that are battling certain things. The God we serve is our all-sufficient God. He is the one we need to look to in all things. A couple of weeks ago on Father's Day, I spoke to you about one of the names of God, a beautiful name, Abba Father. And that name, it, it just gives such a, an intimacy, such a closeness for us to our Heavenly Father. It connects us in that family way. That He's not just a God. He's not just the one who created Elohim. He is Abba, Father. He is your Daddy. What a beautiful name. But God has other names too. And these other names describe His nature. They describe His attributes. They describe who He is. Today I want to look at another one of those names. A Hebrew name, which describes one of God's attributes. You see, no matter who you are or how good you think that you have been, there is an aspect of God that we all, every one of us, all of us need to inherit in order for us to inherit in eternity. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can buy. It's not something that you even deserve. It is a free gift from Jesus Christ, His Son. This particular name describes that requirement. And it opens up heaven to us. This name, Jehovah Sitkenu. God, my righteousness. I cannot have righteousness outside of Christ. No matter how much I try or how perfect I attempt to be, I just don't have it within me to reach that required level of perfection in righteousness. I am righteous because of Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning in the name of Jesus, the one who paid the price on our behalf. And we want to say thank you, Lord Jesus. Today we're going to celebrate in communion once again. We're going to share as we partake together in remembrance of what you have done. And as we look to your name, Heavenly Father, Jehovah Sidkenu, you are our righteousness. And we understand, Lord, that outside of you, we do not have righteousness. In our nature, we are fallen, every single one of us. But in you, we have risen again. We have risen to righteousness. We have risen as a spirit being to a state that we can stand before the Father and be welcomed into glory. And I say thank you, Lord, that it is not on our efforts, but it is on your finished work on the cross. As we listen to this message, Lord, I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to stir it within our hearts, to open up our spiritual ears once again, to open up our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts, that we may grasp what you are saying to us. This all-important message that you have for us, it is critical that we not only grasp it, but we place it deep within our hearts. And I speak, Holy Spirit, would you carry this message and place it deep within the hearts of these lovely people who are watching and listening today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what Jesus did on the cross for us 2,000 years ago? Opened the door for everything that we needed for our eternal inheritance and victory. His selfless sacrifice was a total act of love for you personally. Have you ever caught that fact? What he did, he did for you personally. And you need to know this deep within your inner being. You need to catch it for yourself. That what Jesus did was not just for the, for the world as a whole. It was for you personally. You've got to catch that. His death on the cross was for you personally. If you were the only person on earth at the time 
who needed forgiveness. Jesus would still have died for you. That is his extent of his love for you. An eternal love. An absolute love. A sacrificial love. In Jeremiah 31.3, the Bible tells us that the Lord appeared of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. This is the kind of love the Father has for us. An everlasting love. Isn't that beautiful? An everlasting love. A love that never turns off. No matter what you do, no matter how badly you let your Jesus down, that love is an everlasting love. That love is streaming towards you. It is radiating and you need to feel it upon your skin as it were. The love of Jesus, that sacrificial love, that all-embracing love is for you. It is yours. It is yours to enjoy. It is an overwhelming love which God has for you personally. And you need to settle that within your heart. And when that settles within your heart, a new calmness and a peace takes over. Have you ever experienced that peace? That peace is yours. It is, it is your lot. When you start accepting the truths of God's word, a peace settles upon you. Despite the challenges of the world, despite all those things you are going through, you can still know the peace of God. And this peace is an amazing peace. This peace surpasses all understanding. What does that mean? It means this peace doesn't make sense. It means the people around you probably won't understand why you've got this peace. How can you have such a peace with everything that is going on? How can you have such a peace in the middle of lockdown? How can you have such a peace with COVID-19 being spoken about all over? Yes, you can know that peace because you know your place in Christ. You know your sin is forgiven. You know God's love is upon you like a duvet wrapping around you, holding you tight, keeping you warm, protecting you from the bad stuff on the outside. It's not that you've lost your sense of reality having a peace like this. It's just that your vision has shifted from the things of this world to the things of Jesus. Your understanding has opened up like a flower in the sunshine. The sun comes up, the flower opens, and the flower takes in the radiant beams of the sun. So too, your heart needs to open like that flower. It needs to open and absorb that which God has for you. From the throne room, shining down, radiating upon you. Bringing such a peace and a joy and a calmness that maybe you've never known before. You might try to be achieving that calmness through tablets. But I know a greater calmness and it comes from the throne room. Bear your soul to Jesus. Hand Him all your anxieties. Your righteousness does not depend on your performance. Your righteousness depends upon the finished work of Christ on the cross and how you have received it. You just have to receive it in faith. When you try to find your security in other things, the things of this world, then you are building your house upon the sand. You are going to need a lot of other supports to help you through life. The things of this world are fickle, which means that they change. There is no true substance to them. Some people trust in the stock market, but it can crash. Some trust in their savings, but money is fleeting. Others trust in politicians or hospitals or medical advancements. But we trust in the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. That needs to settle within your heart. I love Psalm 121. It is called the Song of Ascents. Let me read it to you. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. The Lord shall preserve you personally from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. What a beautiful psalm. I love the psalms. We've just finished reading through Genesis and we're on Exodus at the moment. But one of these days we're going to jump to the psalms and you're going to see why I enjoy the psalms so much. The God we serve is a faithful God. And this covenantal relationship of love is offered to each and every person as a free gift. It's yours too. Not free because it didn't cost anything. It cost the world. It cost Jesus his life. But free to be received and enjoyed and developed, may I add. Not that you can develop anything that Jesus has done on the cross, but you can develop that within yourself. You can grow in it. You can become more flowing in it. You can have more peace in it. You can have more joy in it. You can have more excitement to share this with somebody else that they too may have the peace of Christ settle within them. Are you enjoying your walk with the Lord? It's a serious question I'm asking. Are you enjoying your walk with the Lord? Or do you just suffer it along the way? You, like me, we were on our way to hell. A place of eternal torment and separation from the presence of God. That is what hell is. It's separation from God. That peace and joy and calmness. That that I've been describing. This place of hell is devoid of all of that. In a small way, it's like a person suffering from depression. Permanently tormented in their mind. Permanently in darkness and surrounded by coldness. This is not God's lot for you. Jesus came to set the captive free. Who is the captive? The person who is suffering these things, the person who is suffering disease, the person who is suffering mental illness, the person who is under the yoke of sin, that is the captive that Jesus came to set free. You need to recognize the extent of that freedom and start walking in it. Satan's power over you has been shattered by the love of Jesus. But you need to rise up in His anointing and start doing some spiritual warfare against this defeated foe who wants to keep you entrapped in his misery. It's not yours. Do not receive it, child of God. It is not yours. It is his misery. He wants to take as many with him as possible. But that is not your lot in Christ. It is your lot if you follow Satan. Because that is the fruit of his presence in your life. But for us who have accepted Christ, the one who has overcome the enemy, we become an overcomer. We need to rise up and we need to start speaking out our victory. We need to start living out our victory. We need to start shedding the things that are not of God. You know, as a Christian, you can still carry the things that are not of God. You can still carry unforgiveness and hatred and bitterness and all of those things. But it's not your lot. Because when we carry those things, we leave an open doorway for the enemy to come into our life. I shut that door today in Jesus' name. And I speak to your spirit. And I say, spirit, rise up. Be done with unforgiveness and bitterness and casualness and hatred and fear and anxiety. Be done with it in Jesus' name. Cast it out. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and allow Him to do a complete and perfect work within you. The enemy wants you to feel unworthy of the love of Jesus. Why? So that you can remain in His grip of anxiety and worthlessness. The enemy loves it when you feel worthless. Because when you feel worthless, you don't have the energy and the power to stand up and to claim that which is rightfully yours. 
because you don't feel you deserve it. But once you recognize that your righteousness is not found in yourself, it is found in Christ Jesus, then you can stand up and you can allow Jesus to hose you down, to wash away all that muck that is stuck to you. And you can stand proud with Jesus at your side. You know, one day we're all going to give an account of all that we have done. And when that day comes, Jesus will be standing at your side saying, I have paid the price. Everything we're going to be accused of is going to be true. It's going to be real. But Jesus has paid the price and he's washed the, the slate clean. Did you know all sin has to be paid for? Did you know that? Either you've allowed Jesus to pay on your behalf or you will be paying for that sin. But all sin needs to be paid for. That's why Jesus came to earth and died on the cross. So that it, to pay the price for every single person's sin. Thankfully, when we stand before the accuser, we will not be standing on our own righteousness. But we will be standing in the righteousness of Christ. Washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Nothing else can set you free, folks. Nothing else can wash away your sin. Only the blood of Jesus. Why will we be standing in His righteousness? Because Jesus died on the cross for you personally. And you have responded to His sacrifice of love by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that is it, folks. It's not because you've been better than the next person. And when we can... Acknowledge that fact when we can recognize it. It gives us a whole new relationship with other people. We need to stand tall, son of God. Stand tall, daughter of God. You are standing in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make them known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this ministry, uh, mystery, which is Christ in you. This is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We do not hope in ourselves. We hope in a steadfast, faithful hope. A solid hope. And this is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what we're celebrating today as we share in communion together once again. We are remembering that which Jesus has done on the cross. We are celebrating Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. We are celebrating the righteousness of Christ being ours. And the awesome thing is, it's got nothing to do with our perfection because we don't have any. It's all because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. His righteousness is our inheritance and it makes heaven available to us in our imperfection. Spiritually, we have made, been made perfect. But in ourselves, in our flesh, we are imperfect. We don't have to feel less worthy than the next person. Because they in themselves are not worthy either. Do you catch that? Some of you are feeling unworthy. You are feeling less worthy than somebody else. Some of you feel less worthy to enter heaven than, than me as your pastor. You look to me maybe as being more worthy, but not at all. I do not des deserve heaven either. You've got to catch this, folks. It will do away with unworthiness because I am as unworthy as what you are. We are equally unworthy. Do not feel less worthy than me or the next person. You don't know that person's relationship with the Lord. You focus on your walk with Him. Allow the finished work of Christ on the cross to be a complete work in your life. Because when we feel unworthy, we are saying, Jesus, you haven't done enough. I have been so much worse than other people that your blood cannot forgive me. It cannot wash me clean. It cannot make me worthy. And that is not right, folks. That is incorrect. The blood of Jesus forgives all sin. And when I say all sin, I am talking of all sin that has been repented of. 
If you have an unrepentant person living in sin, the blood does not wash them clean. A person needs to come to Jesus and place their faith in Him for their, for their sin to be washed away. It's all about us in Christ and Christ in us. And that's what we're celebrating today. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross for you and for me, imputing to us righteousness, the righteousness that we require to be in good standing with the Father. In Romans 5.17, the Apostle Paul tells us, For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Who was the one man through whom sin reigned and was passed down through all the generations? Adam. Who was the second one man passing down the abundant provision of grace and righteousness? Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ washing away our sin and restoring us to right standing before the Father. How beautiful is that? Jesus Christ instilling righteousness within us that we can be called children of God. You and me, a child of the Most High God. What a beautiful title. In Luke twenty-two nineteen, we are told he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And this was Jesus instituting the Last Supper. So we have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all were eyewitnesses of Jesus. And then in Corinthians, we have uh, from the Apostle Paul telling us this is how Jesus instituted the Last Supper. But today we're reading from Luke. Luke the medical doctor. Luke the one who was there at the Last Supper. Can you imagine what that was like? He took bread. And he Gave thanks. He says, thank you, Heavenly Father. papa. He took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to each of his disciples. And as I break this bread and I give it to each one of you, I ask that you take from that that you have prepared as if I have passed it on to you. I want you to take that. This bread that is broken for you symbolizes the broken body of Jesus that was broken for you and for me. Take that piece of bread or matzos or cracker or whatever it is that you have prepared. Take it now. Let us partake together in unity. Yes, Lord, in unity we partake together in remembrance what you have done. We praise you, Lord. The very next verse, Luke 22, verse 20 says, In the same way after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And just recently we've been reading about the different covenants in the start of the Bible that God made with Abraham and Moses Isaac, Jacob. This is a covenant that God has made with us. When we partake of this covenant, we are ratifying that which He has done in our lives. We are confirming it for ourselves. We are saying, yes, Lord, I am drinking into this. I am partaking with you in acknowledgement of what you have done. We recognize that this is, is a symbol of, of your blood that was poured out for me, shed for me, that I can have the righteousness of Christ be forgiven of all my sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In remembrance, we partake together. When we grasp the fullness of the finished work of Christ on the cross, it does something within us. It transforms us. It opens us up. And we can, like that flower that is open to the sun, we can be open to our God and we can reflect His beauty from within. 
God made the flowers. He made them to be beautiful for Him and for us. God made you to be beautiful for Him and for us. Allow the love of Jesus to open you up like a flower. And you can present the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside to heaven, to earth, to those who love you, to those who despise you. Let us be the righteousness of Christ that others may see the goodness of God within us. I pray for God's presence to overwhelm you as you've listened to this message. I pray for Him to take this, these words and to really weave it within you and to cause a new birth within you, a new birth of something beautiful. God is always looking to do new things. Let Him do a new thing within you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.